poor computer scientists know, if you've ever been a, like a consultant in a computing center, your mantra is, you know, read the blinking manual when, when they come to ask you for questions. But why is it people don't do that? Um, as I'll show empirically, people simply don't read the manual and they tend not to use help. Um, why is that? Number two, how in real work, if they don't read the manual, do users solve their problems? And number three, is there some way we can help users use more help? Now, to put this in context, this is one of two things I do for a living research-wise. And that's um, usability and documentation. The other part, to which I'm actually paid to do, and this is work with Nigel Ward, uh, has to do with dialogue across cultures, natural language dialogue, and you've got a bunch of grants that do this. And Nigel is going to talk about all that stuff, is he not? Yes, later in this series. So just letting you know, this is sort of, what I'm going to talk about today is like half of what we do. Okay, so Valerie Mendoza in her master's thesis looked at usability of a product across time. We've, we've followed a group of teachers, actually. And as you'd expect, when they asked teachers to rate their own proficiency with this product and how frustrated they were with it, the average proficiency went up, the average levels of frustration went down, and in fact, they were highly correlated. Okay, So th this is not something that's just a random occurrence. The funny thing about this, though, is that when we found out how they solved their problems when they got frustrated, they never looked at the manual. They never used help. I think they 0% looked at the manual. That may be because they didn't have one. One, uh, something like 3% maybe used help. Okay? And yet we still get this pattern. We've replicated these findings multiple times. The latest study is with uh, Edith Elizalde, who's a master's student, and Nate Bean, who's a doctoral student in psychology. We interviewed, I think this interview, we probably had 30, 35 people. And then we also observed 11 of them at work for two hours. And we tried to compare what they told us in the phone interview. Uh, in terms of estimating how much they use help systems, what they reported in the phone interview in terms of their actual use, and then in real life, what do they actually do? The obvious result is that whether they say they do, they report solutions, or we watch them, nobody uses the manual. <laughs> okay? I mean, you know, like, at best, they, were, they say that they use it 5%, but in fact, they use it 0% or 2%. Um, they might ask somebody else, and in fact, but they tend to overestimate in general how much they want, they get help from any source. In fact, what they do, largely as compared to what they estimated, is they use some kind of workaround. They do a lot of cut and paste instead of using mail merge. Or they use trial and error. They just go through and try things until it works or it doesn't, they give up. Okay? And in fact, they tend to underestimate when you interview them how much they give up. Okay? Now, this is a replicable finding. Uh, in this slide, I'm showing not only the results of the studies we did, but studies a bunch of other people did. And Solve Without Help incorporates workarounds and uh, uh, trial and error because some people didn't break those out when they did their studies. But, and so this is the study with the teachers I talked about before. They always ask somebody else because they have this bunch of colleagues they're working with. They're all working on the same problems. No wonder they ask somebody else. But except for that outlier, pretty much people never, ever use the manual. They generally don't use online help. They, can, they, they claim they do, but in fact they don't. <laughs> okay, see the difference, right? This is their interview estimates. This is what they actually do. In general, they solve it without help, somehow. Okay? When you say manual, you mean a computer or software related manual or any kind of manual? Any, any, well, any kind of manual, typically. I mean, we also asked about aftermarket books and stuff. They almost never use those either. 
We ask uh, online help includes things like going to the web and looking at the discussion groups. How about on PDF file that people don't print? Do you count this as printed or online? Or? It, it, I think they would count that as online, but but as I say, hardly anybody ever uses it, so it doesn't matter. Really more printed manuals. I know sometimes you get them, and the, and the one the one time we looked, we also looked at. And I don't have these slides obviously because I'm trying to keep this short, but we looked at time since they last used a manual. Okay, and and the fact is that. What, if people are ever going to read a manual, it's always when they install the software. Okay, and then and then you ever look at it again, pretty much. Okay. Okay. Oh, you two yes, ma'am. Were there specific products they were using, or you just any type? Of uh, it depended on the study. Okay, in our study, in the first study we did with Valerie, it was a specific product. In uh, Suparu at all, these were computer science students at at uh, Maryland and Bowie State. At, uh, in what's called current study, these were people in the real world doing real work with heterogeneous things. Although it, they almost always were reporting, the, the number, the, the, the applications they used the most were always Microsoft Office applications and maybe Internet Explorer. Were they aware of the observation that the time yes. you were observing them? They were Absolutely, we had to get the permission. Okay. Right, exactly. No, I mean, was it with a camera somewhere? No, we else? sat there and took notes. Okay. <laughs> and we had, we had a script on the, on the laptop that would add uh, time stamps so we know when things happen. Okay, so why is it? David, did the other, the other studies also do the same thing they, they observed? No. The, these are all different methodologies. Uh, Novik and Mendoza was self-reports at contemporaneous self-reports. Uh, Saparu et al. Both studies were contemporaneous self-reports. Uh, Novik and Ward, 2006, was interviewing people over the phone. Uh, the current study, these two were interviewing people over the phone, and this one was observations. Okay, so these are heterogeneous methodologies. There's some others I didn't include because we couldn't, I couldn't, their data were aggregated too much to break out. Okay, there were other people who did phone, phone interviews with, for instance, the users of a particular word processor. Okay, and they found huge amounts of use of documentation, but there's some reasons not to believe, believe the, their results. So you made a comment that uh, they reported that they use the online manual more than they do. More than they actually do. How Correct. Do you find out what they actually? Because two ways. Number one, so we asked them. We asked them at the end after they we'd done the whole interview to break and say, you know, when you have a problem, what do you do, and divide it up into percentages. That's how we got what they said they did. But we also asked them about. We asked them what programs they used, what applications they used, we wrote those down, and then we said, okay, let's take the first one. What was the last problem you remember having with that? And then we asked what happened to how they actually solved it. And then we said, well, what was the next problem you had with that? We asked them how they solved it. So we had not only their overall estimate, we had actually, we could, we could compile from their specific recollections how they actually did it in their recollections. And the third way we did it was, was by being on site noting the problems they had and figure out what they did. Okay, so we've got their overall estimate, we've got our estimate from their recollections, and we have direct observation. Dr. Norbert, one Yes, of course. Have you, have you considered, I think you mentioned something about adding a script. Have you considered adding a script to, I don't know. Well, we, 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 I, let me say this. So we feel real confident, we, I mean, given the fact that people all over the country are replicating these results. I feel real confident about this distribution. Mm -hmm. Okay, the, the, the issue that we're really facing is not whether people don't use the manual or do. Okay, and we broke it way fine down. We, we asked about chat groups. We asked, you know, everything. Right. The issue really is why not? Why do they muddle through? Okay, and you'll see some evidence in a minute that this is actually pretty costly. Jack Carroll is the most famous author in this area. On, 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 he wrote a book called The Minimal Manual and so forth, uh, the Nuremberg Fund. Anyway, so they, he and Mary Beth Rawson came up with a couple ideas to explain this, but this is the best we've got and it's not enough. So they thought there was something called the production paradox, namely that users are so worried about doing what they have to do now that they're not investing the time they need to do it right in the future. Okay, that's idea number one. Idea number two is the assimilation paradox, that is, they have some things they know, and they're going to apply it no matter what the problem is. Okay, if they know cut and paste, 
you know, no matter what they should be doing, if there's a function, they're going to do it, okay? So that's the current theory. When we did the observations, we were able to find lots of workarounds, lots of use of inappropriate techniques. So the idea is that, you know, they're supposed to go from here to here. There is like the Excel function that does it in one step, and instead they're creating this vast spreadsheet and adding up all the numbers by hand, which is, which is this method, okay? In our observations, we found a, a significant usability problem about once every 75 minutes. The users usually spend about a minute hunting for a solution. And then they do a work or, or and or they do a workaround. The workaround usually takes 10 minutes when in fact if they used a more appropriate method, they would have taken two or three minutes. The mail merge example is one of those. This person was cutting and pasting items out of an Excel spreadsheet and generating separate versions of a Word document like a letter. And you know, if they'd spent five minutes setting this up with mail merge they would have saved them the 40 minutes it took them to do it by hand, okay? And they probably, and then the interview we asked them, they, they had a inkling that there might be some better method, but they still didn't look, okay? Why is that? Well, it's, uh, actually I'm speaking next week with an economist here on campus who does microeconomics, and we're gonna talk with him about it. The psychologists don't really, we talk to the psychology department, they don't have a really good idea. We asked people what their problems with Karen Ward and I asked people what their problems with uh, documentation were. Why didn't they look at the manual? They said, number one, 80% of them said that online documentation was hard to navigate. Or sorry, uh, yeah, and printed documentation also. Uh, they thought that appropriate explanations were, in, the, expo the explanations were inappropriate. They, they said it was tend to be pitched to the wrong level. The problem is, of course, that some people wanted it at a very simple level, other people wanted it at a very complex level, and that gets lumped together and people say it's the wrong level. Um, they want problem-oriented organization. Uh, some people claim that there were problems with presentation. Uh, other people worried about completeness and correctness. But even if all these were true, and help systems were still hard to navigate, it's still hard to understand why it's so hard to navigate that nobody ever uses them. Uh, currently conducting a study with Oscar Morade and Nate Bean to try to see if there's a way to get around this. Our theory is as follows. Remember I said that people read the manual at the beginning and then never look at it again? One of the things they do is read the tutorial. Right? If they're going to look at help at all. But that doesn't give them any help, any practice in using help. Rather, they've read the tutorial, now they're using it, and now when they have a problem, what do they do? They muddle through. So our thought was, instead of having, say, the tutorial for publisher, of which this is an example, we were going to give them our own tutorial that looks like this. And basically it says, use the help system to learn about to learn about publisher. And we, we tell them how to get to the help system, and then we say, okay, use the help system to learn about this, learn about this, and learn about that. And we're currently conducting a study using uh, administrative assistants across campus who, who would like to learn about publisher. And, um, and we have two groups. One uses the Microsoft tutorial, one uses our help tutorial. And the idea is we give them cases they haven't, we give them tasks they haven't seen before, and we're expecting, if the theory holds, that the people who had the Microsoft tutorial will do workarounds and muddle through, and the people who used our tutorial will go to the help system. That's the theory. Now, it could turn out to be wrong, but at least we'll know that and we'll go on to something else. So that's what we're, that's the research we're currently doing. And uh, those are the members of the research group uh, in, our, in our most recent photo, and uh, these are some of the publications which have come out of this line of research. And, uh, and basically, other than Karen, everybody else is a student. So that's what we're doing. Questions? No? Excellent. Yes, sir. Okay, you're talking about, the, about people looking at manuals. Um, is, do, do those trends also reflect that the lack of, like, when, I, when I purchased uh, Word, I didn't get a manual with my, uh -huh. with my Word. Do you think that some of those trends 
could also be influenced by the lack of uh, software developers and including manuals? Well, we looked into that a little bit. Um, but the fact is that you had access to online help too, right? And, right. and they don't use that either. So uh, it's, and even when people were using proprietary software, something like the, you know, the, the, the thing their company provides in order to track customers or something, they still weren't reading the manual. Okay. So uh, it, to a certain extent, some of those figures reflect that, that, that nobody has printed manuals anymore. But more, over, but more than that, it reflects the fact that people simply don't use help systems. And, and the observations, it wasn't like they, you know, complained there was no manual. They, they didn't try to use the help system online typically. They may have done it for a minute or something. But then they just, typically they just sort of looked through the, you know, marched through the, the did a, a depth research of the, uh, of the uh, uh, menu structures to try to find what they thought the function was, okay, if, if that. Right. Otherwise, they get up the, the trusty tools they know and just apply them no matter what the, what the circumstance. And, and it's perplexing because not only did we spend a heck of a amount of time and effort producing all these help systems and manuals, but the people, the users are actually losing a lot of time and making mistakes because they don't have the knowledge they need. And there are a lot of theories. As, I mean, we have some theories as to why this might be. This might be that the number of functions to learn is so huge that there's no point in reading the manual ahead of time because the odds on hitting the function you're going to be using are very small. Um, it, you know, we're, we think there's an economic theory underlying this that has to do with, with sort of uh, maximizing utility based on effort, but we don't really know what the what the, uh, what the, what the model's going to look like. Luke? Uh, very often when you use some help system, then there's a screen, was this help useful? Uh, <laughs> is this feedback actually changing the way to deliver the help? Or I, I, I don't know the answer to that question. I mean, I, I always do. Do you ever send it back? I, I, I yeah. never do. I, so <laughs> it's, like, it's like an extra step, right? I mean, <laughs> you get $10 off my next Microsoft product when I do that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but this is not only about the manual, this is also about asking others for help. Yes, correct. Because in my experience, when I have a problem, I ask Leo, I ask people in the right. IT, I ask my colleagues around, right. that's my normal Yeah, we track problem. that too, obviously. Okay, and, and, and this is also not being done, right? It's, it, it, I mean, the teachers did it all the time, okay, it, but, but that's a special it? case because they were using okay. the same product, same problems, and they were all together, okay, in this, in this one school. So it cannot be explained by just quality of manuals? No, it's, yeah, correct. It's, 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 they don't seek help. Um, and you have to ask yourself, you know, pretty honestly, the last time you had a frustrating episode with your application, did you look for help or not, or what did you do? You know, and and if, if you're representative of the computer science students in, uh, in some part of his studies, the answer is you probably didn't look for help. Great. Thank you, guys. I have to say, this talk is on a project that's almost an advertisement.